Hello, everyone. Welcome from across this gorgeous planet. We are many past one mountain where our mission is what Barbara Marks Hubbard and Dr. Mark Offney call the planetary awakening in love through a unique self symphony. Together, we declare that the last day of the old face of evolution is honored as the first day of the new face of creation. I am Christina Tehal, the co-executive producer, along with Krista Josefa and Kirsten Zohar. And we are delighted to be here with each and every one of you today. I welcome all the new people. Please do share that you are new in the chat box. We want to hear from all of you. When you do chat, chat to everyone by making sure that your chat settings say all panelists and attendees and not just all panelists. Use the chat function to say hi, to let us know where you're from and to resonate the Dharma. In many past one mountain, we are connected, we are whole and we are expressions of the entire process of creation. We are activating a new humanity and we are awakening as a new species, Homo Amor, the fulfillment of Homo sapien. We are a church, a synagogue, a mosque, a temple, a zendo. We are all of it. No one is excluded. Everyone is included. And we come together to attune to the evolutionary impulse awakening within us. Welcome home, everyone. We're overjoyed to be with you today in week 211. Let everyone know about Many Past One Mountain. We are doing this primarily through word of mouth. Leadership around our community is a absolutely sacred opportunity. On YouTube, we are One Church, Many Past One Mountain. On Facebook, we are facebook.com forward slash onechurch.world. Right now, we are streaming live on YouTube and Facebook. Please take a moment, copy either of the links from the Zoom chat box, and share those live links on your favorite social media channels like Facebook or Twitter. After our communion, we will send you an email to invite your friends and family. You go ahead and forward that email right away after our gathering. Spend time on our website, www.onechurch.world. On the top menu of the homepage or the bottom of each page, you will find our membership link. Awesome news. A return to Eros, the radical experience of being fully alive by Dr. Goffney and Dr. Christina Kincaid is now also an audiobook. I can't, and it's read brilliantly by Gabrielle Anwar. I can't recommend this radically inspiring, important book enough. A return to Eros helps all of us recognize more deeply how love's energy literally drives reality. Right after our live broadcast, we offer a special invitation to take your seat at the table of history as a revolutionary and global activist. In these first principle deep dives, Dr. Goffney will apply first principles, first values, a new story for a new humanity to public culture as a response to the crises of intimacy happening in the world right now. With that, I give you a little bit of what to expect over this next period. We begin with a, dark, with a recap from last week, then Dr. Mark sets our intention, then David will resonate the ev evolutionary love codes that we're working with. We move into prayer, then evolutionary sermons with Dr. Mark. And then Krista will invite us to commit our outrageous act of love and to contribute our gifts to this revolution. And then we bring everyone on at the end for our goodbyes. 
Mark wrote what he called evolutionary love codes. Mark and Barbara studied the codes together, often comparing them with Barbara's own 52 codes for conscious self evolution. These codes grew out of their radical commitment over a hundred collective years, crystallizing the new story of humanity, quote, evolving the course of consciousness and culture, which is the source code of love, unquote. Each communion is a standalone and every week's communion builds on the week before. Many Paths, One Mountain is radically committed to telling the new story. So here goes my recap from last week. Ode to evolutionary joy, the next step. Joy is a first principle of cosmos. Evolutionary joy is the highest form of joy. When we open the door to joy, the cosmos that lives in us becomes awake and ecstatic in ways that are in some sense unimaginable and unimpeachable. Molecules literally have an alert, explosive wave quality of joy. As we feel the allurement, as we access, find, experience, joy is right there. The universe feels and the universe feels joy. From first values and first principles, we are weaving a new story. We're weaving a global ethos for a global civilization, the most urgent, ecstatic, trembling, and vital moral imperative of this day. In order to make this revolution, in order to stand poised between dystopia and utopia, we have to access directly the actual quality of evolutionary joy. There's a false joy equation that is the calculus of most of reality today. This false joy equation is what I have plus what I am missing equals joy. This is not true. It is not how it works. That is not how it happens. What is true is that joy is an immediate quality of reality that literally inheres in cosmos in every second. Evolutionary joy does not mean that you have bypassed pain. Joy and a broken heart are not opposites. The opposite of joy is depression because when we are depressed, the circuits are closed. Depression is demarcated by the bone crushing experience of futility. We experience our broken hearts because when our hearts break open, then all the wisdom that says on my heart falls in. All the depth and all the discernment all go in. Systems theory states when you come to equilibrium, when you come to stasis and there are no new inputs from the outside of the system, that is death, that is depression. That is the nature of a closed loop system in which no new energy enters. By contrast, in an open loop system, far from equilibrium, even a minor fluctuation point jumps all of reality to a higher level of consciousness, aliveness. When we are far from equilibrium, when we have an open loop system, when we are receiving new inputs all of the time. New inputs only come from this unique moment of time. We plug our unique self into the wall, meaning into reality, and we receive the electric body of the cosmos blowing our hearts open with evolutionary joy. With that, I invite us to more deeply enter into the holy and sacred space of many past one mountain. And I turn my word to you, beloved Dr. Mark Offney.
Beloved Christina to hell. Thank you for that completely gorgeous Dharma recap. Like totally, totally. Thank you. So let's just give right Christina to hell just like our, our mad, delightful, wild. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the chat box, like big, huge. Oh my God. Okay. So are we ready to go? What's our intention today? And let's maybe have our code in the chat box, which we're going to get to in a couple of seconds. And we have a wonderful Amor today. Every week we do a particular rendition of Amor. Amor means love, but not ordinary love. It means its insides are aligned with love. It's a love that's the real first principle and first value of cosmos. My job now is not to talk about Amor, though. I'm supposed to do that in a couple of minutes. So I might say that again, because that's really important to say. But I want to set our intention. And I want to set our intention with with an enormous sense of delight in my heart and with a small request for whoever's for whoever's not muted to mute themselves so we can kind of hear you a little bit. So everyone just kind of check your mute button, especially on our team. That'd be awesome. Thank you so much. So I wanna, I wanna set our intention today with your permission with an enormous sense of delight, with enormous sense of destiny the unimpeachable and irreplaceable importance of what's going on here every week at Many Pass One Mountain. As we are in this moment between dystopia and utopia, and we're literally poised between these two worlds, as we summon the energy of the evolutionary impulse, whose insides are lined with love, and we respond to what we know to be the Leonardo da Vinci moral imperative, the overriding demand of this time, which is to articulate a new story, to actually articulate a new global ethos for a global civilization. We understand deeply that the potentia, the potentiating, the possibility that awaits us for good and beauty and goodness and truth is unimaginable. And at the same time, we stand poised before a level of catastrophic risk, and not only catastrophic risk, but we're at the precipice, as Toby Ord correctly wrote in his book by that name, we're at the precipice of true existential risk. That is to say, there is no future, that we actually devastate the basic systems of reality and either humanity disappears or is so crippled, so unflourishing, so devastated that we never recover. And in this moment, patchwork solution won't work. Individual nations retreating into their silos won't work. Polarization is poison. We need to actually come together in order to create coherence. And coherence is only based on intimacy. Coherence means that there's a shared identity between the parts that create then a larger whole. And that larger whole is intimate. There's a shared identity. There's mutuality of recognition. We recognize each other. There's mutuality of pathos. We feel each other. There's mutuality of purpose. We have shared purpose together. Global coherence based on a new evolutionary intimacy can only be achieved, can only be realized through the only thing that creates intimacy, which is a shared story. Every couple of every kind, every familia of every kind that actually shares destiny and not only fate. Sharing fate's not enough. We have to share destiny, meaning we have a shared story. We're part of a shared plot line. We have a shared vision. We have a shared telos. We're in some sense going to the same place together. Not that we lose diversity. Diversity is an essential part of union. Gorgeous, unique self-symphony in which every nation, every people, every group of people plays stunningly their own instrument in the unique self-symphony. And it's even a jazz symphony. We even step back in adulation and adoration as we hear the notes of particular gorgeous players at particular moments, this nation or that religion or this system of thought. But it is a symphony. 
We're part of the same music. We value that music. We share a fundamental musical score. There's a shared story. And what is a shared story itself? What a shared story actually is, is a weaving together of separate parts of the best and deepest wisdom from pre-modern times until the Renaissance, then modernity, and then post-modernity from let's say the mid fifties, early sixties till today. All of the major wisdom streams, the validated leading edge insights from all the major insights, pre-modern, modern and post-modern woven together in a new coherent intimate whole, that is a new story. That's a new configuration of intimacy because the crisis we face, the pandemic in all of its poisons is but the expression of the deeper fault lines in society. The core is a global intimacy disorder. It's a crisis of intimacy. And we only heal a crisis of intimacy by articulating the next step, the next vision of intimacy. Because reality itself, evolution itself is the evolution of intimacy. And I'm speaking here, not metaphor and not mysticism. I'm speaking science, interior and exterior science. Reality is evolution and reality is the evolution of intimacy. Reality is the progressive deepening of intimacies from the first three quarks that come together in the first nanoseconds of the Big Bang until right all the steps of separate parts cohering intimately and in larger and more gorgeous holes, new configurations of intimacy. So as we face this crisis of intimacy, this global intimacy disorder, poised between utopia and dystopia, facing catastrophic and existential risk, and yet holding the radical positivity and optimism of evolution itself that's moving towards the weaving together of new holes from separate parts. The way we respond to the crisis of intimacy is to articulate, to generate a new configuration of intimacy because it's only new configurations of intimacy that respond to crisis. Our crisis is a birth, our crisis is an evolutionary driver, as my beloved homemate, evolutionary partner, Barbara Marks Hubbard said with us, and Barbara's here with us today. Barbara founded, and this was one of the most exciting things in her life. And it's funny, you know, Barbara, it's so gorgeous to be here with you. And, and there's a number of movements in the world today trying to, in some very sweet, naive sense, place Barbara where they find her comfortable. But the last five years of Barbara's life, she was aflame in a new way. She wasn't just repeating the old. She was wildly excited. We spoke or communicated four or five times a day. And this new set of first principles and first values, the sense of evolution as the evolution of intimacy and the evolution of love, this movement from what Barbara used to call homo universalis to what Barbara and I called together homo amor, this emergent of a new human and a new humanity who is a unique configuration of perspective and intimacy, of outrageous love. That's what animated her. That's what, that's what she was on fire with. And Barbara, you're, you're with us today and we're with you, right? We're all together. That's our intention. Our intention is to play a larger game. Our intention is to step into the breach and to be the revolution, to speak on the abyss of darkness and say, let there be light, to cry out against all forms of injustice, and more importantly, right, to add light, to add intimacy, right, to actually articulate the new story, because it's only that shared story that in this moment of humanity's 11th hour will allow us to walk through the breach and birth gorgeousness and beauty for the trillion possible future generations instead of this generation or one of the next five or 10 being the last one. So we couldn't be more serious and we couldn't be more delighted. We couldn't be more devoted and we couldn't be more devastated. We laugh out of one side of our mouth. We cry outside of the other and we set our intention. So with your permission, right? All of us gathered around the world, we link hands. So I am so personally honored, privileged, delighted to be with you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And if I can, with our ritual of every week, can I ask you a question? Are you ready to play a larger game? Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm looking in the chat box. Are you ready? Are we ready to play a larger game? Are we ready? Are we ready?
to participate in the evolution of love. Oh my God, yes. And cry out the yes and scream out the yes and actually find the yes of the big bang that you initiated because where could you have been other than right there? You did it. It's all you. And your yes is the evolutionary impulse awakening to itself as conscious evolution, as you, as evolutionary love. And the word is good and its insides are aligned with love. All of reality is a love story, not a metaphoric love story, not a Pollyannish love story, but the actual eros, core to our first values and first principles, which we're demonstrating in the interior and exterior sciences, reality is eros. It is amor. It is animated by outrageous, by evolutionary love. So let's go to amor. Right? Our chant every weekend, I believe it's David, David and Christina Amlon this week, I believe, right? doing amor, which would be awesome. Right, so let's hear a more and let's chant it around the world. A more, right? Its insides are aligned with love. Yay, David and Christina. Oh my god. God, yay, yay, yay. Thank you so much. And anyone and everyone, David, Christina, that was gorgeous and sweet and beautiful and filled with heart. And Krista is our lead executive producer, is bringing together an actual gallery of Amor that she just posted in the chat box. And everybody and everyone, we're inviting, you're invited, we're inviting each other, make an Amor. You can be like me, You're, you can be a little off tune and a little bit off pitch, which I always am, but you sing with your heart aflame, with your heart open, and the unbearable sweetness and uniqueness of your amour opens up the lips of reality. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. David, we've got a hugely important code this week. And what we're doing every week, as Christina Amelon said in Evolutionary Love Codes, is we're laying down first principles and first values. Right, the basis from which we weave a new story. And at the top of the hour, I'm now in, am I in West Coast time? No, I'm in East Coast time. In my, I'm in Miami, it's 123. So somewhere around two o'clock, we're gonna do a second part, about 20 to 30 minutes of first principles. But for now, let's just say that the evolutionary love codes are, are the ground, right? The codes that we articulate every week are the ground from which we're drawing first principles and first values of cosmos from which we weave the new story. And the collapse of first values, the collapse of first principles make it impossible to create coherence, to create a shared story, to create global intimacy, right? to create joy. So every week we're actually articulating, and Barbara and I did this for 130 weeks together, and much of the material that we worked on will unfold over these years. Many weeks, Barbara gives a talk from one of the talks she gave on the original codes. Of course, on the new codes, she can talk only quietly and silently. 
but she whispers in my ear all the time. And, and Barbara Marks Hubbard's with us in, in, in every second. So take us inside, David. Let's see the code in the chat box if we can, friends. We got the code in the chat box. All right, let's see if we can get there and find it. There. Coming at you, Mark. There it is. Coming at you. There. Okay, here, right. we go. here we go. So let's all follow this code together. Here we go, David, and blow us away. Full heart, full love, all the way. Thank you so much, Dr. Mark. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, and it, I had the privilege of, of making that a more with Christina. It, just a reminder how, uh, you know, reconfiguring intimacy with each other, getting to know Christina more, learning about her life, singing, dancing, laughing together. Uh, it just delighted me and, and woke me up to this, you know, amazing joy. So let's find that joy together, friends, as I resonate the code. What is the character of the outrageous lover? And why do we call it outrageous love and not unlimited love? Because outrageous love is animated by both outrage and love. Come together in a higher synergy of sacred activism. And yet the outrageous lover is filled with pure joy. And yet the purity of the outrageous lover is always tinged with a little bit of paradox. It is joy and paradox that merge outrage and love into the higher union of outrageous love. And I'll do it one more time and let's resonate even deeper, finding that outrageous love character that we have within ourselves. What is the character of the outrageous lover? And why do we call it outrageous love instead of unlimited love? Because outrageous love is animated by both outrage and love come together in a higher synergy of sacred activism. And yet the outrageous lover is filled with pure joy. The purity of the outrageous lover is always tinged with a little bit of paradox. It is joy and paradox that merge outrage and love into the higher union of outrageous love. And with that, I turn my word back to you, beloved Dr. Mark. Sweet man. Thank you, sweet man. Let's just take a look at the code together for a second. When it takes a look in line where it says come together, we'll put in there again, outrageous, outrage and love come together. David, beautiful resonance. Where it says come together, let's just copy it over and put an outrage and love come together in a higher synergy. So we can copy it over like that. David, thank you. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. All right, friends, you get a sense of this code? This code is taking us in a new direction. And it's taking us in an unbelievably important new direction. You know, Leonard Cohen, who we're about to hear from, and, and Leonard's with us every week, and someone can maybe copy and paste with the new language, the code back in the chat box. Leonard Cohen was filled with outrage. He was filled with outrage at corruption. And he wrote song after song, right? Outraged at corruption. And at the same time, Leonard lived for joy. He battled depression his whole life, and he knew that joy and depression were opposites, and his whole life was to access the portal to joy and to let joy and let love. He was a lover. He has a great song called I'm Your Man, which is about just serving in devotion the feminine. But if you know anything about Leonard Cohen's songs, they're all about love stories. Right? His whole life was right, a series of successive love stories, right? He was, he said, you know, they call me a womanizer. He said, I'm not a womanizer. I'm just madly in love. And, and we're not talking about or suggesting, right, now particular positions on how a person should live their life. We just want to honor the fact that Leonard Cohen was a lover, right? And he, he believed he was in devotion, right, to the feminine. He was in devotion to love. And he battled depression, he battled depression with joy and he battled outrage and he wanted, he embraced outrage and yet allowed the outrage to come together with love. And we're going to talk about what that means today, because what we're really about the last two weeks in this week is to try and characterize, you know, in the old traditions, they would talk about what's the nature of a homo religiosus, right? What is the quality of the righteous one or what is the quality of the enlightened one? So let's ask it this way. What's the quality of homo amor? What's the typology? What's the character of homo amor? Or said differently, right? who is the outrageous lover? 
What does the outrageous lover feel like? Right? How do they play in the world? How are they responsible in the world? How do they feel inside? What's the interior feeling of the outrageous lover? What is the mind of the outrageous lover? Right? What's the heart of the outrageous lover? That's what we're going to be talking about. It's what we talked about the last two weeks when we said that, that the outrageous lover, homo amor, can only make the revolution, can only articulate the new source code, can only transform reality fulfilled with joy. Now, today, we're going to bring that together with outrageous love. What's the relationship between joy and outrageous love, and particularly between outrage and love? And I want to point that out. The words outrageous love have in it outrage and love. And I had a, a very funny running set of conversations with our dear colleague and friend, John Mackey, who's a, a grocer. And John was the, the board chair of our think tank, the Center for Integral Wisdom for a whole bunch of years. And, you know, until he completed his term and a, a wonderful human being. And, and John said to me, don't make it outrageous love. Talk about unlimited love, right? It's less provocative. And, and he said, an outrageous love has rage in it. And I said, John, yes. Outrageous love has rage in it, right? Outrageous has rage in it. And you can't actually access outrageous love without a dimension of rage. And what does that mean? And how do I prevent that rage from burning me up? How to prevent that rage from turning me into that which is degraded right, and poisoned and ultimately corrupted by its own rage? How do I allow myself right, to actually be madly in love and at the same time, holds the quality of outrage, both its explosiveness and the rage in it. Because friends, there's, there's what to be rageful about. And we're going to talk about that as well. So how do we, who is, who is homo amor? What does it feel like to be homo amor? How do we actually embody the evolutionary impulse as homo amor? Wow. So we're going to do something a, a little different today. Right? We're going to enter into this typology. And, and let's start with prayer. Let's start with prayer. Are we ready to pray? Right? It's, it's one, but we're about 32 minutes in. Okay, we've got to pray now. Now, you can't access outrageous love without prayer. And what prayer means is, remember, the God you don't believe in doesn't exist. So prayer means I'm not talking to, I'm not talking to Santa Claus, and I love Santa Claus, right? But I'm talking to the infinity of, of intimacy, right? The infinity of intimacy, which is the quality of intimacy that adheres throughout cosmos, which has a personal face. So the personal between, right, Jackie, right, and your beautiful daughter, Exochito, beautiful Jackie and her beautiful daughter, right? Right, the quality, the personalness between you participates in this larger field of personhood, which is the personhood of cosmos. Cosmos has a third person, the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry, the laws of mathematics, the third person qualities of eros, which animate the four forces, the strong and the weak nuclear, the electromagnetic, the gravitational. That's third person. There's a first person quality, my experience, reality having a, right? Reality having a Suzanne experience, right? Reality having a Krista experience, reality having an Oots experience, reality having a Lynn Schwartz experience, right? Right? Reality having a Colleen experience, reality having a Paul Kwame experience. And Paul Kwame, you got to tell me if I'm pronouncing it exactly right. And you filled me with joy this week, Paul. Thank you. Right? A reality having a Veronica experience. So that's first person. That's the first person experience, but then there's second person. It's the personhood of cosmos that knows my name, right? the infinity of intimacy. And we turn to the infinity of intimacy, right? And we say, hold me, hold me. You know, sometimes I can't feel like I couldn't feel, so I tried to touch. There's a blaze of light in every word, the holy and the broken hallelujah. And I throw myself right, as a lover, as a child, as a daughter, as a sister, as a brother, Right, before the infinity of intimacy. And I say, hold me. Let me whisper my secrets into your ear. Hold me, hold me. Promise me you'll never drop me. So we turn to Leonard Cohen, to our hymn of every week. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Take us inside. Now I've heard John. there was a secret chord. And we're all in the hymn and we're all in prayer. Let's join our hands around the world. 
But you don't really care for music, do you? Do you? In the chat box. It goes like this. The fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the baffled king composing hallelujah. 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 And we find each other in the chat box, right? And we pray and we ask for everything because prayer affirms the dignity of personal need. Prayer has nothing to do with fundamentalism. Prayer has nothing to do with inappropriate magical thinking. Prayer is actually validated by the sciences, interior and exterior, and actually is an expression of a first principle and first value of cosmos, which is the personhood of cosmos. So imagine you hear my voice. How do you hear my voice? Your intelligence hears my voice. It's not your ears. Your ears are the physical exterior expression of intelligence. So if your intelligence hears my voice, could the larger field of intelligence not hear my voice? 
could the personhood of cosmos not embrace me? So we go to the chat box and we pray and we ask for everything. And we ask for our outrage and our love to come together in sacred activism. And I'm gonna read the prayers with your permission. Here we go, right? I pray, right? I pray, Paul, the need, the ask, the gift. I pray the world may come together as one love, one global communion, right? One shared story, right? David, I pray to navigate my next steps towards outrageous love as I move out of my apartment today. Yes, Shahati, I pray, focus. I pray for focus. I'm about to get marked that list of all the people, right, from the festival that I'm he's so delighted to receive for financial abundance massively and for serving she in the best way steady, right? Rob, I pray that love goes viral all over the world. Amen. Jackie, right? Yes, I ask for everything that helps me express my outrageous love, energy, inspiration, right? In every moment. Oh my God. Terry. I pray that love in people's hearts prevails, right? Fran, welcome. The outrageous love expresses, right? Herself in me. Oots. I pray for us to soon become intimate on a common worldwide news story, right? Oh my God, right? Claire, praying for the soul of Samuel Patty and for a six-year-old son who will never see him again. Oh my God, right? The tragedy, right? The tragedy of tragedies. Lynn, right? I pray for the outrageous pain of unlove in our societies, families, and hearts to explode in outrageous loving unity. Medea, right? Whenever I see your name, my heart lights up, right? Medea, oh my God. And Ivan, I pray my heart expands in its capacity to contain audacious love, joy, passion, bliss. And I am becoming goddess in all our flavors, right? Amen. Suzette, I pray for first principles and first values, right? Ilja, it's so awesome to see you. It was great to have you with us at the festival this summer. I pray for all the people around the world, right? Feel as one, right? In all their diversity, I pray many hearts move forward together. Rob, Suzette, I pray to hear the whisper of she and the right words to communicate pure love and joy, right? Shahati, yes, the smile of the goddess herself, right? Claire, I pray for the children in war zones around the world. Inaka, Inaka, I pray to feel, hold wisdom coming up. Jamie, I pray for the healing of Mother Earth. I want, right, Shord. Shord, it's good to be with you. I want everything. Vashti, that all the rage on earth unite with love, the hearts and minds of all the people. And Vashti, who was in the biblical text, the first wife of Erxes of Ahasuerus, who experienced rejection. For anyone who's experienced rejection to know that you're already chosen, right? You're already chosen. Right, G Mag, I pray for more fully realizing my full potential, right? Lifting it all. Benjamin, I pray that animals and other non human beings are included, absolutely included in our outrageous love. Absolutely cosmocentric outrageous love that includes not only humans, but all living beings, right? Right, Joycey, right? I pray for the most perfect election results, right? Amen. Paul, I pray for a new narrative filled with hallelujah, right? Jacqueline, Lady J, I pray that we may blast cosmos with the pulse of outrageous love awakening in our hearts. Jill, welcome, Jill. It's so good to see you. Right, Henry and I pray that we may continue to open our hearts to the reality of outrageous love. Jill and Henry, thank you. Right, and Inika, right, and Veronica, I pray to dance and to sing as she. Rob, Rob Canna, to continue my way. Joyce sang, it's so good to see you that all the world leaders, Joyce, lead with the heart of love. Right, Suzanne. Right, justice, health, right, every creature, Nancy, right, that we feel the intimate love, right, right, and let's bring it all together, friends. Let's bring it all together, right? Let's bring it all together and let's raise it up. Let's raise it up and impress these prayers on the lips of the infinite personhood of cosmos, the infinity of intimacy that holds us and lives in us in the very same moment. And the word is good and all obstacles are melted away, right? Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you. Oh my God. Okay. So are we ready? Are we ready? Who's ready? We got to go deep into this Dharma today. Are we ready to go? So, so let's try and, try and understand today the character of the outrageous lover who embodies the evolutionary impulse, who articulates the new source code, who stands in the breach, who is evolution, right? I am evolution. But what does it feel like to be evolution in this moment in time? What does it feel like to articulate the new story? So Barbara Marks Hubbard, right? We're holding hands together. You would always hold my hand, right? When we were about to talk together. So let's do this together. So what's the connection, outrageous love? Why is, why is there outrage and love together? 
And this is the first time we've ever talked about this. And let's hold this together really close, okay? Okay. So you can't have outrageous love without outrage. But then you've got to bring outrage and love together. And outrage has two qualities. One quality, right, is outrageous in the sense of explosive. Right? It's not ordinary. Right? Outrageous love is not ordinary love. Ordinary love is a particular human expression, right, which we call romance, right, that lasts for a few weeks or a few months. So we've exiled love to the human realm. We've exiled to the romantic expression, right, of human emotions and to a particular several week or several month infatuation period. So that's ordinary love. And it's often a strategy of the ego or an expression which is hormonal and beautiful but fades away. It's true, it's beautiful, it's sacred, but it's not yet outrageous love. Outrageous love is the heart of existence itself. It's what pulses in every atom. It's the song of every beetle. It's the yearning of every tree, right? It's the delight of the coral reef. It's the cry of the dolphin, right? It is all of the macromolecules, right? In their stunning cacophonies of sound and wave all over the world. It's all of it. It's all in here's with literally, right? Outrageous love. And we know this, we know this, we've talked about the science extensively, right? The pulsing of allurement and eros that animates the four forces. And in their own language, in the interior sciences, they had the same access to the same reality. The Upanishads, they write, right? Whenever you dissolve into helpless laughter, right? Transport, transported by a magic show, opened by a joke, your body and belly tickle, drenched by a sudden shower, Dive into that source of laughter. Surrender to the surge of joy. Surrender to the surge of joy and the Upanishads complete, illuminating the essence of reality. So yes, there's joy that inheres in reality itself, which is a quality of love. And that love is outrageous love. That's one quality of outrageous. But there's a second quality of outrageous. And the second quality of outrageous is rage. I'm angry. I'm angry. And let's get angry. Do you remember the show? There was a movie, Christina Kincaid, remind me of the name of the movie, right? There was a movie which was about the, 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 the sense in the world, right? The sense in the world that, oh my God, I'm angry. It's corrupt. It shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be this way. It was a movie from, from several years ago. It was called Network. Network, thank you, Terry. Thank you, Christina. Network. And there's a particular moment where the, the, the protagonist in the movie says to everyone, right, open up the window and just say, I'm angry, right? And people all over the world, people are shocked. I'm angry, I'm angry, right? We're angry, we're outraged. I'm outraged, right? That people are actually willing to take a calf, a little calf and put the calf in a tiny cage, right? And cause the calf to suffer immensely and intensely for three months, bloating the calf in order to get a little piece of lamb chop, right? That you get to eat for like 90 seconds because you think your 90 seconds of joy is worth imposing excruciating pain on that lamb, right? And I could go on. I could start talking about milk farms and chicken farms, right? I could just talk about the outrageous pain that we inflict frivolously on the animal world. Right? I could talk about right, the fact that 2 billion people in the world today don't have access to sanitation, right, to water. Right? I could talk about the fact that there are literally tens of thousands of people dying in the country that I live in because they don't have fundamental life insurance. Right? They don't have fundamental, excuse me, health insurance. So they actually can't afford to get threatening conditions treated. So daughters sit by their mother's bed their mother who's worked their entire life and she dies because she can't afford treatment. Really? Really, is that possible? I'm outraged. I'm outraged, right? We're angry and we need to get outraged. I'm outraged by the fact that Google, Google, we talked about it last week in our first principles conversation, is not a company which is organizing the world's information. Google is a data mining farm to serve the imperative of selling advertising based on creating predictive analysis, 
right? Based on turning your personal experience into data that can be the object of manipulation for targeted ads for consumers and voters. That was a big few sentences. You can take a look at what we talked about last week. It's on our Many Paths, One Mountain site, but actually the entire imperative of the entire world of Facebook, Verizon, Google is robbing our personal experience in order to manipulate us right through the emergence of digital, digital dictatorships. That's outrageous. That's outrageous. And the beginning of a totalitarianism that will actually create a case system in the world that will make India's case system look like the most benevolent nursery school in history. We're outraged. We're outraged. Right, And we can't be careful. We can't, those of us who live in the United States, we focus all of our outrage right, on you know, a particular person. And we think that person's removed, then it's gonna be solved. But actually the systemic issues right, are systemic. Right? They're part of the fabric and we have to change them. And we're only gonna have the energy to change them if we're willing to open up our window and say, I'm angry, I'm outraged. And in the great traditions and the Aramaic texts, they called this reticha de oraita, right? The anger of the prophet, the anger of Malcolm X. Martin Luther King got it right. He got love right. He got nonviolence right. But Malcolm X got something right also. I've got to get outraged. So who's willing to find that outrage right now in the chat box? I am outraged. It acts as outrage. I am outraged. Evolution as me is outraged. I'm furious, right? I'm angry, right? I'm beyond angry. I am outraged, right? I am outraged, right? Feel the outrage. Let it well up. It's impolite. It's not, you know, Marin kosher, right? It's not, right, new age kosher. It's not, right, it's not fundamentalist kosher, right? It's not neoliberal kosher. Right? It's not conservative kosher. It's actually the evolutionary impulse itself. Right? It's the anger, the outrage of the prophet. I am outraged and outrage is messy. And I've got to access that outrage. And that outrage has got to turn into activism. It's only outrage. Without outrage, you will not get sacred activism. Love by itself. I want to get this with you. Love by itself will not generate sacred activism. Love and outrage need to be brought together. And that is the fierce feminine rising. It's the fierce masculine rising. It's the fierce face, right, of the evolutionary impulse. I am outraged and I claim my outrage. Now, let's go slow here. Let's find this. Let's find this deep inside, okay? Let's find this deep inside. Can we find this deep inside? Okay, and let's see, let's see the code in the chat box. Let's see the code in the chat box. Let's see the code in the chat box. We've got to beware of the hijacking of outrage. Beware, beware. For example, the outrage of the great traditions was actually hijacked, the outrage against, the outrage got turned against those who were called infidels and those who were called unbelievers. And the outrage became a tool for power manipulation as Foucault pointed out in his genealogy of morals. And it's not by accident that Voltaire leading the modern enlightenment said, remember the cruelties. So under the guise of outrage, outrage is easily hijacked. Outrage goes wrong easily. The gorgeous experience, right, of this direct, stunning, unimaginably beautiful participation in the infinity of intimacy, right, which characterizes the depth of realization, that's beautiful. But then when you actually take God's name in vain and you say, okay, I'm gonna be outraged for God, right? I'm gonna be outraged for God, but actually what gets mixed into that is egoic agendas. What gets mixed into that is old trauma. What gets mixed into that is power agendas. And so how many times, right? Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, back when I was 12 years old, right? How many people died in the name of Christ? I can't believe it all, right? right? That's the taking of God's name in vain. That's actually hijacking outrage, right? Wow. The Crusades, right? A cynical political hijacking of outrage in the name of God. And at the same time today, we have so many voices hijacking the fierce feminine. We have so many, right, people in different dimensions of culture who attack others, who demonize 
whole groups of people who forget about the rules of evidence, who demonize entire populations like men, right? The demonization of the masculine, which is tragic in the name of ostensibly Kali, the fierce feminine. No, that's a violation of Kali. Kali would never demonize, right, the masculine. If the masculine and the feminine live together. We don't need more feminine consciousness. We don't need more masculine consciousness. We need more feminine at a higher level of consciousness. We need, we need feminine that's not ethnocentric, right? The mother of the Nazi, right? Who sends her child to battle. And we need more masculine that's not ethnocentric, right? Which actually goes in, pillages and rapes the earth. We need the masculine and the feminine, not an ethnocentric shadow consciousness. We need the masculine and the feminine at world-centric and cosmocentric consciousness animated right, by outrageous love. And we need the masculine and the feminine to come together. So just like you can hijack fundamentalism, you can hijack the fierce feminine. You can hijack Kali in all of her modern new age forms, right, for the sake of every form of evil. You can actually pretend to be a victim advocate and be engaged in, oh my God, being a terrible perpetrator. That's called the victim triangle. I pretend like I'm a rescuer. I pretend like I'm a victim. I'm really the perpetrator. That's the hijacking of the name of God. And in the name of God includes the name of the goddess, the fierce feminine. So you've got to be careful. Outrage doesn't mean we reject outrage. That's the principle of non-rejection, which is core to evolutionary tantric thought. We don't reject outrage, but we hold outrage with tender care. We bring outrage together with love. Does everyone begin to get that now? Can you feel that? Outrage and love have to come together. Outrage and love have to come together. Do you get that? And in that movie, Network, that we just cited earlier, right? the protagonist in the movie, and either Terry or Christina will remind me of his name, the protagonist in the movie, that he fails in love. So he feels the outrage, but he can't access the love. And when outrage comes, when outrage is split off from love, right? then outrage becomes evil then outrage becomes a tool of power. But when love is split off from outrage, then love becomes pallid, insipid, limpid, and weak, right? Outrage and love have to come together. So how do you bring outrage and love together? So there's five qualities. We're going to do each of them in a few seconds. Five qualities that allow us to bring outrage and love together. Number one, number one, when you're outraged, your heart's open. Say it again. Howard Beale, says Christina, Howard Beale is the name of the figure. Howard Beale, right, in the movie network, and everyone should see it, right? He accesses outrage, he can't access love. Thank you. Okay, so five qualities, five qualities. Okay, five qualities that allow the marriage of outrage and love. And it's only when outrage and love come together, we feel outrageous love. And outrageous love is the shocking joy, right, of the cosmos awake as love. And it's also the cosmos demanding perfection. It's the cosmos crying out in rage against that which is unlove. So how do I bring outrage and love together, which creates outrageous love? How do I do it in my own body as homo amor? So there's five, five qualities, five dimensions, five alchemical qualities that actually bring, bring it together. And the first is I've got to have a raging open heart. Okay, and I've talked to some of you about this this week. And it's when I'm in my fierceness, my heart's got to be open. And I'm fierce beyond imagination. Whenever I access my quality of fierce raging, my heart's got to be wildly open. And that's true in every dimension in life. For example, in sexuality, when you're engaging in a kind of vital sexing, right, the play of radical vitality in sexing, it's beautiful and sacred if your partner can feel your tender heart, quivering tenderness, wide open in the same moment. So you never lose touch with your wide, radically open heart. Okay, that's the first quality, right? Outrage demands an open heart in the very same moment, number one. And number two, which is related, right? Joy, joy. And I'm always in joy. I'm always accessing joy. And I don't wait. And here's the key. I don't wait for complete fulfillment to get to joy. One of the great mistakes of revolutionaries is until the revolutionary succeeds, we can't be in joy. That's not true. 
I'm in joy all the time, all the time. I have the capacity as homo amor. I have the capacity as an outrageous lover to experience radical joy in partial fulfillment. Does everyone get that? Radical joy and partial fulfillment. Joy, blessing comes from satisfaction, but I can be satisfied a thousand times a day. There's a thousand blessings in the day. I have the experience, I have the capacity to experience full joy in partial fulfillment. And we're gonna talk more about that, but that's key. That's key. So there are a thousand portals to joy a day. Being together with you for me right now is radical joy, right? Drinking a hot tea is radical joy, right? Actually realizing, oh my God, I have a liver and my liver is functioning, radical joy, right? I see a palette or a color and the color just blows me open, radical joy, right? I hear right, the wind and the wind moves me, radical joy. I see a face of a child lit up, radical joy. Right? I do, right? Outrageous acts of love. Every outrageous act of love brings me radical joy. It's a radical joy, partial fulfillment. Not when I've gotten there all the way. That's the great mistake of the revolutionary. The revolutionary is animated by joy, full joy from partial fulfillment. That's two. Three. Three. The outrageous lover has to balance the purity of outrageous love with paradox. The ability to hold paradox. And if you can't hold paradox, you can't do outrageous love. Can't be done. Does everyone get that? If you can't hold paradox, you can't do outrageous love. It's always both. It's never quite good and evil. It's never quite joy in a broken heart. I've got joy in a broken heart at the same time. I'm masculine and feminine at the same time. I'm universal and particular at the same time. I'm black and white at the same time. I hold paradox. And in that holding of paradox, I reach for a third, right? I reach for a higher integration. I reach for a higher union. If I can't hold paradox, and that means I'm laughing all the time because the quality that allows us to hold paradox is laughter. And if I lose access to laughter and I lose access to joy, then my outrage goes dark. It goes corrupt. It goes evil. That's what Umberto Eco writes about in his novel, The Name of the Rose, where the priests are being poisoned and we're not sure who's poisoning them. And it turns out that every priest who goes to the library and takes out Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics and goes like this, right? Turns the page, the side of the page is poison. And which page is poison? The page that talks about laughter because the assistant rector, right? is against joy and against laughter because it actually mocks the outrage he feels against the corruption of God's word. Whenever outrage loses touch with joy and laughter, we go to poison our fellow human beings. We go to poison animals. We go to poison the earth. So I need to be able to hold paradox. And number four, I need to be able to not only wake up to outrageous love, I've got to also be able to grow up. I need to actually evolve my consciousness. That means two things. One, to grow up means psychological maturity. It means I can see my traumas. I can see the voices of my parents. I can see how I'm so defensive and so reactive and I get so outraged because actually my stepfather or my mother right, is talking to me. So I, I'm able to actually grow up. I can actually move beyond my early trauma and actually be fully present in the present. I'm not constantly rehashing the circle of trauma. That's to grow up. That's the first part of growing up. And then I need the second part of growing up is I've got to move from a circle of intimacy, which is egocentric, where I have a felt sense of love, care, concern, and joy for me and my family. That's egocentric. Most Westerners are egocentric. Their felt sense of love, care, and joy is them, their family, and their few friends. That's the whole deal, particularly the liberal world. It is profoundly egocentric. I got to get to ethnocentric. I got to have a felt sense of love, care, and joy for ethnocentric, for my people, my nation, not in the shadow form, in the healthy form, but I can't stop there. I got to move beyond ethnocentric and I've got to be world-centric. I have to feel the pulsing joy of every human being on the face of the planet and live in this shared new story and know that that which unites us is so much greater than that which divides us. But then I got to jump. I got to go to cosmocentric, every animal, every fish, 
right? The oceans themselves, cosmos itself. I take responsibility for the whole thing. I feel the pulsing of life in the allurement of subatomic particles. I feel the whole biosphere radically alive, pulsing with life, joy, interiority, and meaning I'm cosmocentric. So in order to actually hold outrageous love, I've got to grow up psychological maturity and, right, and critical and the move from egocentric to ethnocentric to world-centric to cosmocentric consciousness. Four dimensions. Four dimensions. One, I can be outraged if I'm filled with joy. Two, if I hold paradox. Three, if I grow up psychological maturity and I actually up-level my consciousness to a genuine cosmocentric consciousness. And four, my outrage is married to love. That's outrageous love. Wow. And then we can look at each other and we can say, we live in a world of outrageous pain. And the only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. Right? Wow. And the outrageous lover does what? The outrageous lover commits outrageous acts of love. And now perhaps, dear friends, brothers and sisters, and we're brothers and sisters, literally, we're holding hands, brothers, outrageous lovers. We've actually created a page, a Facebook page, where we're going to we're going to gently launch it and share it over the next few months. And then in the early spring with Christina, we're going to do an outrageous love course. And we're going to be talking about this summer at the festival, the laws of love. We're going to do an outrageous love course. But at the core of everything is I awaken to my identity as an outrageous lover. My heart becomes a flame with fierce sacred activism. I take my unique risk. I step into the breach, right? I wake up like I've never awakened before and I'm filled with outrage. I'm angry. And oh my God, I'm a lover. I'm madly in love at the same time. And my outrage and love come together. And that's the quality of outrageous acts of love. That's the transmission of outrageous love. Outrageous love is not tepid. It's not insipid. It's not a kind of, right, let's get together and do an exercise. It's I'm actually filled with the fierce passion of evolution itself, awakening uniquely in me as a unique configuration of outrageous love. And actually I become an atheist, meaning there's no God to do it. There's only divinity as me that's gonna actually address a unique need in my unique circle of intimacy and influence that can be addressed by no one that ever was, is, or will be except for me. And that is my unique risk. And that's my outrageous act of love. So it's got a quality of outrage, meaning it's outlandish. It's beyond. It's, it's, it's beyond imagination. Terry, you did that a couple of weeks ago, right? When you send me a note, that was an outrageous act of love. It was a gorgeous, outrageous act of love. And I received it with all my heart and soul, right? Paul, right? You did an outrageous act of love, right? A few days ago, right? right? And all of us were outrageous lovers, right? We're actually that my unique self means I take my unique risk and I commit my outrageous act of love. And so what we tried to do this week was to try and characterize, try to get a feeling. What does it feel like, right, to be an outrageous lover? Oh my God. And I never lose touch with that quality of being held and known, right, by all that is. So I wanna, before we go to Krista, I wanna finish with one piece. I wanna give you a sense of what it means like that I'm an outrageous lover, right? I ain't. I am evolution. I am the intimacy of cosmos. I am the savior. We are the saviors of God. And in the very same moment, I can access that quality. Forget about the particular fundamentalist cast of it. I can access that quality of intimacy where I know I'm being held in every second. And I send you a, a link this morning, Christina Amelon and Suzette and Krista, that beautiful link of that father and son, right, playing. And I want to ask everyone, to stay with us for the last four minutes, then we're gonna hear from Krista, right? right? And, and just to feel this quality, and this is the fifth quality. I said there were five qualities, that the outrageous lover has to know, I'm partners with the larger force of cosmos that holds me. It's not just me. And that's what Marx lost touch with. It's what Lenin lost touch with. And then you become a demonic monster. If you lose touch with the larger field that holds you in every second, tenderly embracing you. And so that's the fifth quality. I can only be an outrageous lover if I know that the personal face of outrageous love is holding me. We're partnering. We're holding hands in every second. So friends, right? Brothers, sisters, let's open our hearts 
and actually become outrageous love and feel this last fifth quality in this second. Christina Amelon, take us inside. Here we go. Full screen. Yes. Spirit lead me where my trust is without bothers. Let me work upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be much stronger In the presence of my Savior Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders Let me walk upon the waters Where I Upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail, mm-hmm. and there I find you in the mysteries and oceans deep. My faith will stay. Oh my God, right? Can you feel that? Who can feel that? Can you feel that? Oh my God. Oh my God, right? So that's the infinity of intimacy that knows my name. And brothers and sisters, we're not gonna do first principles this week or I'll do them next week. We'll hear from Krista in a couple of minutes. Let's bring this together. Wow. I can be an outrageous lover when I know that I'm held by the infinity of intimacy that knows my name. On the one hand, I am outrageous love. On the one hand, say the interior scientists, every person needs to be an atheist when it comes to committing 
your outrageous act of love. Don't rely on it. There's no God to do it, right? It's you. You are the voice of God. You're God's hands. You're God's feet. We pray with our feet when we go to protest. We pray with our hands when we actually take into our own hands a particular situation and destiny that needs engaging and transforming. We are God's heart. We are God's verbs, right? We are God's verbs. And so atheism was created according to one master for just that moment where you don't turn to God, but you turn to the infinity of intimacy that's uniquely configured in you, as you, and through you, that never was, is, or will be ever again other than through you. And you're filled with the explosive, outrageous joy. And you're filled with outrage against injustice. And you demand justice and you become justice. But you never become corrupt because you never lose the joy. And you never let it get hijacked. And you never let your personal trauma and your personal agenda and your personal ambition hijack all the good words, hijack outrageous love. I mean, you're actually a perpetrator, right? Hiding right, as a rescuer or hiding as a victim. Beware. You bring outrage and love together in their most gorgeous reality. And to do that, let's do it one more time. And then we're going to turn to Krista. So one more time, to bring outrage and love together is what it means to be an outrageous lover. And to do that, I need one, that outrage and love are married, which means in the midst of my outrage, my heart is wide open. I'm fierce beyond imagination, and I'm quiveringly tender beyond tender at the very same time. Could you feel the tenderness between that father and son? Could you feel that incredible tenderness? Could you feel that sense, right? Like, oh my God, how tender they were. That's what tenderness feels like. Two, two, you're filled with joy and you cannot be filled with joy. You cannot access joy unless you're living in your unique self. The portal to joy, there's an electric code, an electric cord, that is all of us, but at the end of the cord, there's a plug. That plug is my unique self, and it's only my unique self. Meeting the unique moment that plugs into the electricity of joy, which is cosmos, and allows me to access the surging joy, which is the very aliveness of reality, which animates, which illuminates in the language of the Upanishads, all of existence. So that's two. I'd have to be filled with joy. But three is I can only be filled with joy through the mediating prism of my unique self. And my unique self has to meet and be present in the utter uniqueness of that moment. And that's three. And four, I can only be present in the uniqueness of that moment if I can actually move beyond the trauma. I move beyond the circle of trauma in which I keep repeating old moments, which then cause me to allow my outrage to be corrupted right, and to devolve right, into a way, a form of pseudo-eros to cover over my pain, and then I become corrupt in, in every manner of corruption. So I've got to be able to move beyond the trauma, to access the unique presence of this unique moment, merged with my unique self, which is my portal to joy, right? I need to know and how to hold number five paradox, not contradiction, paradox. The outrageous lover always holds paradox. And my ability to know that actually good and evil, righteousness and corruption are far more ambiguous than we thought. I'm outraged. I stand against it all, right? I'm, I'm an angel of justice. And yet I hold paradox. I grow up, right? Number six, and I'm not egocentric. I'm not ethnocentric. My love is world-centric and cosmocentric. That includes my egocentric family. It includes my people, but it's every human being and it's every, all life, right? All of reality. Oh my God. And I know finally, number seven, that it all matters, that there's a purpose, there's a direction, that no one's extra on the set, that nothing's extra on the set, no life form, no sentient being, 
right? No dimension of my life ever detours a destination. Every place I've been, I need it to be. It all matters. I'm awash with the nectar of knowing that even though so much of it is mystery, it's all meaningful. Those are the qualities of the outrageous lover. And all of them come to bear when we commit outrageous acts of love. And I want to thank one person. We're working on, on gathering right, a, a full-time salary for Krista. And we were one-third of the way there a week ago. And someone stepped up and we're now two-thirds of the way there, which is fantastic and awesome and gorgeous. And we want to get one more third. So I want to thank that person who asked to be anonymous, who took us that second third, which was a wild, outrageous act of love. Thank you. And Krista is about to share with us, right, the outrageous act of love page. So if you can, find that once a week. And an outrageous act of love can be something you did for a friend, something you did for a cause, something you did for yourself, something you heard about. You can tell the story of an outrageous act of love that you heard about. But we prefer you. You're an outrageous lover. Your outrageous act of love can be any act where you stepped up and you just, you were love. You were lived as love and you actually put that into reality. And Krista will give you a whole bunch of examples and invite us to join. And I just want to ask everyone, just one, just gentle, gentle, so gentle, humble, right? Make this yours. Become a member, right? Step off the place of being a spectator. I'm watching. Step onto the court. Become a member because it's your membership that animates, that resources, that makes this alive. And I turn the word with so much delight to you, Lady Krista. Yes. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Beautiful. As we are coming here together, many past one mountain, I have this image of all of us walking up the mountain together, coming from all directions, all the many paths, coming to step into this revolution together. And we all bring our unique gifts. And some of us step in and share all of their time and all of their energy and all of their excitement. And others step in they come walking up the mountain with a bag of money to give. And I'm so, 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 so grateful for the person who stepped in to help us take this next step. And I just want to read you one sentence that he sent to us with this gift, which is actually a, a quote of Mark Gaffney. Where there is a need observed and an ask received, there is an obligation to give. Mark Gaffney quoted from the erotic and the holy. There is an obligation to give and we all have that obligation to give, that obligation and responsibility to make this revolution our own. And we do that by committing our unique outrageous acts of love and to inspire each other all throughout the week and all over the world. We share these outrageous acts of love on our Facebook page. So I just want to show you that beautiful page where so many of us have been sharing beautiful, beautiful stories. Here is Laura sharing an amazing song. I'm not going to play it right now, but I can really recommend you to check this page out. It's Facebook, Outrageous Acts of Love. Here is a story of the Pope as an outrageous lover, actually. And here we have a beautiful yoga teacher teaching yoga in refugee camps. Beautiful pictures, poetry, stories, outrageous love letters, outrageous love songs, a new one actually by Mosa. I can also recommend you to listen to that. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful stories and music and I want to invite you to participate and we commit outrageous acts of love by sharing a story of someone that we know who has committed an outrageous act of love or our own outrageous act of love or by writing outrageous love letters and you can write an outrageous love letter to anyone and anything even to a flower to a tree to your grandmother it is a beautiful way to access this dharma, this first principle of outrageous love in yourself, a beautiful practice. So I invite you to do that and to share your outrageous acts of love on this Facebook page. Please make sure to click here on the community page. This is where all of you can post and I will repost all of your posts also on the homepage. So that's where you can read all the posts. 
If you want to learn more about what outrageous acts of love are, what this first principle is, please check out our website. It is onechurch.world. By the way, for those of you who are wondering when this name change is going to happen, we have changed the name into Many Paths, One Mountain, and I'm working really hard to make these changes happen. So thank you for your patience. Right now, the website is still onechurch.world. And here on this page, Acts of Love, you can find everything you need to know about committing outrageous acts of love so you can join us in this amazing practice. Also on our website, you can find here, if you click on resources, an amazing blog. Every Friday we post a new blog that actually has the, a summary of quotations from the Dharma from the previous week. So if you don't have a lot of time that week or if you couldn't join, um, you can check it out here and it's just a five minute read to get you updated on the first principles that Dr. Margovny spoke about. And of course, we do invite you to watch these amazing, beautiful clips and receive the transmission even deeper. So for that, you go to our watch page where all of the replays are uploaded, but also our amazing editing team is creating beautiful, beautiful clips every week. These are short clips that you can easily share with your friends. So I invite you to do that and share this revolution with the world. And then also on resources, there is a page called books. And this is where you can find many, many beautiful books. These are the core foundational books that Dr. Mark Gaffney and Barbara Marks Hubbard have written. And you can find them all here. And it is truly a gift to dedicate time to actually study these first principles and really dive deep into them. Here you can find a return to Eros. And as we've shared before, the exciting news that a return to Eros is actually now also available as an audiobook, which is narrated by producer, actor, and director Gabriel Anwar. So please go to Amazon, find that audiobook, and listen to this beautiful, beautiful transmission. And last but not least, our membership sites. Becoming a member of Many Paths, One Mountain is a way to contribute to this revolution, to really make it your own, as Mark said so beautifully, or actually in my own words, to get off that couch and step in and really join this revolution and make it your own. This is ours. No one is here to get rich from this. We are all giving our all to contribute. So you can do that by making a one-time donation right here, or you can step in and become a member and make a monthly contribution. It already starts from only $25. And of course, we love to give you with even more presents, presents if you do decide to step in. So you will become a part of our online community, which is on Facebook, where we meet each other, we laugh and cry with each other, we practice with each other, we share our insights of our studies, and we actually have a study group going on right now, um, facilitated by Jamie and Christina, and the next study group will actually start November 14th, and they will st together study Unique Self, Awakening as Unique Self. So if you want to join that together with members, you can study that course. You can actually find that course all the way down here because if you step in as a member, you will get access to these nine beautiful courses. And here's where you can find Awakening Your Unique Self. But there are eight more deep dive courses that you can take with wonderful practices to embody the first principles yourself. So thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. I'm so excited to be here together and I can't wait to be together again next week. Mm -hmm.